Today I'm painting figures again. This time I am going to leave the background dark rather than light, so it's a little bit different. And uh, I'm painting them intuitively as well. So I hope you'll come along for the ride. If we haven't met before and you're new to my channel, I'm Pat from Scrivener Art and Design in beautiful uh, Vancouver Island, Canada. So I love teaching and sharing. And if you have any questions that come up, uh, please ask them in the comments below. And um, if you're new here, consider subscribing to my channel and giving the video a thumbs up. It really helps the algorithm. Also, if you share the video to other people that might enjoy watching it, that also helps as well. So let's take a look and see how this painting progresses. And if you stay till the end, I'll uh, show you some um, of the painting close up and in a room setting. I hope you enjoy it. So grab your cup of tea. It's a bit longer video and let's get started. I'm doing some negative painting around the chalked out figures and I'm using a transparent turquoise, um, thalo turquoise by Golden and it's quite transparent so you can see what's showing from behind and it's also of course shifting the colors. So I may or may not end up leaving this but for now I'm just trying to um, establish my background and I'll decide going forward if I want to make it a more solid color but I kind of like some of the patterning that was going on there so just going in around these figures that I intuitively found in the messy background and um, starting to yeah just shape them up a bit with a negative painting I like to save as much as I can uh, initially. Uh, you can always get rid of it, of course. Here I'm adding some magenta, quinacridone magenta, onto the dresses. I used a lot of this color in my underpainting, so I'm just enhancing it now. Every time you put on a new coat of the um, color is going to become darker when you're using transparents. Also, it will allow the understory to come through and maybe do some optical color mixing as well. So I really do like the magenta over the uh, cad orange. It shifts the color to a really nice uh, rich color as well. Adding a little bit of orange in places. This is cad orange from Chroma Paint and it is very opaque. So I do like using it for that quality when I do want to cover things up in the background. trying to leave some of those shapes that were created earlier. I am actually painting the legs in on this lady. Sometimes I paint around what was there and uh, sometimes I either collage them on or paint them on. So in this case, I'm adding a little orange to these legs and coming back in on the dress as well. I mixed up a lighter shade of orange by adding a white to it so it becomes a tint. And I'm using a little bit of that in a few places on the face as well. Adding a little bit to the legs so you want to make sure that you keep your paintbrush moving around your painting. 
and you want to also make sure that you mix your skin tones from the colors on your palette so it stays harmonious. Just making a few adjustments here with my chalkboard chalk. I like using chalk. As you see, it's very easy to change and erase. So just kind of reforming this figure a bit, giving it a little bit more shape. Now adding a skirt line to this one. So make sure that you keep your hem lines at a different uh, length for interest. You can consider each figure as a shape and you know that we want different shapes in our painting. I like to use the rule of the three bears to have three different sizes of shapes. So thinking of Papa Bear, Mama Bear and Baby Bear. It's an easy way to uh, keep that in mind so we don't end up repeating our shapes so much. So I'm just, uh, I finished painting the area below where the legs are. I painted it in with the Thalo turquoise as well. At some point you have to decide also who's standing in front and who's behind in your figures. So you can see that beautiful blending I got with the magenta over top of the teal. It makes a really pretty purple. So that is called optical mixing when you put a transparent over something on your painting and it shifts the color. Now, if you have an unharmonious painting where you've used colors that aren't really working, putting a glaze coat of a transparent color over the whole painting will bring it into a nice harmonious look. Of course, it will shift the colors, but one of my favorite colors for doing that is a quinacridone nickel azo gold, which unfortunately is not available right at the moment. So um, you have to try something else. And one way of safety netting that is to put a barrier layer on by just by barrier layer. I mean a um, coat of a soft gel gloss or a gloss medium just so that it won't be absorbent. And then you can test a few different colors. So you see me now painting negatively around this gal. I decided to shorten her dra um, dress and give her legs. And now I'm refining her shape a bit, flaring her skirt out so she has a different um, shape than the other ones. And I'm here thinking about changing her arm shape as well. So this is the nature of painting like this is that it's not necessarily um, the perfect shape when we start, but we can keep adjusting it as we go. And I'm deciding if this gal would like to have a scarf. Kind of thinking about an arm here. I'm drawing in some flowers. Now just coming back in with that cad orange that again is very opaque and just changing the shape here of the skirt and the arm. Adding a little bit of that orange on the other side and on this skirt as well, just to keep your eye moving in and around. You want to think of balance over your whole painting. So color balance uh, is one, one thing to always consider, as well as just a feeling of balance with your shapes.
So now I'm getting rid of that arm by just painting over it with the Thalo turquoise and putting a little bit, bit of an edge So often with this style of painting, I find a, a story starts to evolve. Um, sometimes I think of a title while I'm creating it, and that, of course, um, influences the story or vice versa. So now I've added that teal scarf, just cleaning up around there a bit and considering putting some collage legs on. And this is a vintage uh, dictionary that I'm using, and I'm just using some matte medium to glue it down. Now you saw me pull it up there. This one's giving me a little bit of grief. <laughs> so I like to use a catalyst wedge to uh, really make sure it's solid on my piece. Just coming back in with some more paint, building it up so you can have nice, rich colors. So it is a yin yang of going back and forth with this type of, of work when you're not uh, following a photo reference. And even if you are following a photo reference, there comes a point where the painting needs to take a life of its own and you need to develop that relationship with the painting. So I'm just coming in and making some of the legs lighter and now adding a bit of a stamp. Deciding if I want to add a bag, a hat. So if you've been watching my videos, you know this is something that I do to figure my shapes out and the scale of my shapes is by cutting out um, paper. And in this case, it's um, that vintage dictionary. So this may all be painted over in the end, or some may show, but I find that it gives me a chance to test things out and see if I like it or not. Does it stay or does it go? You have a little time to ponder too, even after you glue it down. So I'm going to put a hat on this lady and I'm putting it on her head on a tilt so the tilted hat can make her look like she has her, her head nodded. So this also gives one person a different character and you want to start thinking about who might be your hero character in your painting, who might take center stage. Um, it's not always or necessarily even good to have the person in the middle to be your hero. So right now my eyes are definitely going to the vintage text on the middle gal because of the high contrast of teal with the white. So wherever you have that high contrast in value, you will be drawn to. So this is something that I will probably change going forward. So 
So slightly shifting the color on this one in the middle. I'm using some cadmium red. Adding a little bit to some of the legs. So now I'm glazing over this text so you can still see the text, but it pushes it back so they're not so dominant. And I'm going back into some of the head shapes, adding a little bit more color. So I tend to go back and forth on my head shapes several times, um, building up layers of paint and um, starting to put in some shadows and color uh, in different places so it's not for me it's not once and done um, I do like building up many layers in my work and right now I'm just adding that hand so I've decided to paint this a purse on this side and I'm using a teal fluid paint from Golden and I'm going to add it to the hat as well. This is bringing that teal from the scarf in the middle over to that side a little bit more dominantly and I'll just add a bit to the actual dress as well. So adding a little bit here and there because it's on my brush. Now I've mixed a lighter uh, tint of the magenta with some white and I'm putting a little bit on this dress to just change it slightly um, so everything isn't feeling all the same. So if I put that someplace, I need to put it someplace else. So just coming in on this figure, adding a little bit as well. Adding a little bit of it down in the leg area too, just to tie the painting together. So keep your brush moving. Um, I'm using a one inch flat. You could use a slanted brush as well. Either way you can get a nice edge. coming back in and making a few more marks, deciding that teal was too strong and I glazed over it. So you can still, still see the pattern, but it's pushed back. So that's what using transparent does. So I really encourage you to try using transparents as well as opaque. And um, they really work differently. Of course, you can make tints out of both of them or tones, pushing them uh, darker or lighter. So coming back in on the legs again. Now you don't have to put legs on everybody necessarily um, or two legs. It depends on where the person is in the painting. On the tallest gal in the back, I eliminated her legs. And I think 
is just not necessary and it would get too crowded below. So you kind of have to decide what looks right as you're doing it. There are no formulaic rules for this. It's just really your eye is guiding you on, on what you like and uh, when it feels right to you. So we are really working from our imagination and from our design experience. So you're developing your eye every time you practice painting like this. So back at those faces again. Now, also the question is, do you put hair on the, the heads or do you leave them without? And again, that's just very uh, personal preference and you can decide what seems to be fitting for each painting that you do. For a long time early on, when I was doing figures, I didn't actually um, put hair on my figures. And then somewhere along the line, I did start doing it. So now I go back and forth or I leave some with and some without. Um, again, it's all personal, what you like and really what the picture is asking for. So just cleaning up those edges a little bit and remember you can always adjust shapes with your negative painting. Giving a little, little more um, shape to these legs. And that nice triangle under the arms, the arm, and back in with some more polka dots, big polka dots. I did decide to put some hair on and right now it is bright magenta. I'm using some chalk pastel to just add a little bit of outlining um, in teal. Now, pastel will uh, flake off, smudge off, so it will need to be sealed either with a fixative or a spray varnish. I usually use either uh, Spectrafix or Krylon working fixative for pastels. And then you can easily put a coat of um, clear medium over top of that. So really just finessing things at this point and putting a bit of glaze over that pink that looked a little bit um, like bubble gum to me. I kind of like the, um, the addition of the bubbles in the background, giving it kind of a party-like feel or street lights glowing in the dark. Just coming back in on this dress again. I think I'll add this arm on this scale just to give her a little bit more dimension. A 
Now her bag felt wrong. It's not large enough. So I'm going to glue a larger bag over top of that smaller bag. And I've decided to change the color of this gal's bag over here. I'm just adding a strap with the edge of my paintbrush and I'm going to bring the teal over to this side of the painting as well. Just coming in behind, putting another leg down on that one. I'm going to keep the legs in the background darker. Changing her shape slightly here. So when you get near the end, um, it's really good to stop and pause and take a longer look from being so close up to it. It's very helpful. Also taking pictures as you go so that if you tend to overwork your work, you can see where a good stopping place would have been. This is a gentle reminder um, for you not to continue overworking your paintings. So how do you know when your painting is finished? That's really personal um, preference. I myself like to sit with it and see if there's anything that's kind of niggling at me that I feel like it needs to be changed. And I also don't like a lot of canvas texture showing on my work. So if I'm painting on canvas, I like to make sure that I have heavy paint, not scanty paint. And just little, little details that maybe just need to be addressed. Or maybe something absolutely isn't working and it needs to go. Sometimes we hang on to precious in our work and we just um, don't want to let it go. But in the end, realize it really wasn't enhancing the painting. Getting a critique of your work can also be helpful, providing it's from somebody that is going to give you good, honest feedback from an educated point of view, opposed to maybe asking your spouse or your son or daughter or your best friend. Uh, A, they may not be educated in, in the art world or uh, they may just say nice things or they may not say nice things. So just be really cautious about who you ask for advice and feedback and never take it personally because everybody has an idea of what they like and they're coming from their own perception. So just be really mindful of, of asking for feedback and uh, take it with a grain of salt. Same if you enter a jury show and you get rejected, um, just press on. Don't take it personally. It's just not worth it. If you continually get rejected though, it's a good thing to reach out to somebody for critique. And I do offer one-on-one -on -one coaching where I can give you helpful feedback for your work or help you pull together a stronger series, uh, a portfolio, anything that you really need help with. So you can find the link on my website if you want to uh, purchase 
an hour of coaching and get some personal feedback or some critiques. So I'm using a Posca pen here to give a little bit of outline. So Posca pen is acrylic and I often use it for signing my work as well. I find it's um, easy and they're very reliable. They don't seem to um, you know, quit, quit running or be very sporadic with the, the flow of acrylic. I've found them to be very reliable uh, acrylic pens. And believe me, I have tried many. That, I think, wraps it up for this video. I hope you've enjoyed watching and that you will leave a comment or a question and maybe even help me with a title suggestion for this painting. So I appreciate you and keep on creating. <laughs>